Welcome to Critical Omissions with Douglas Dietrich, the internationally recognized renegade military historian. He takes hidden history and exposes truth they say you aren't ready for, the truth that the government conceals from you. So brace for impact. Here's Douglas Dietrich. Okay, welcome to Topical Tuesday. This is Critical Emissions. I'm very glad to be here and certainly in far better physical shape than uh, my latest transmission on Saturday, uh, which, of course, I'll uh, put the context to that, that I was quite sick, uh, physically ill. And I was suffering from what's known as sunsickness. Uh, basically, uh, I'm very photo um, uh, sensitive, and I uh, get very sick when overexposed to the sun. Uh, I can stand it for periods of time, and it's always an unpredictable symptom. Uh, I can uh, go out a few days in a row uh, under solar exposure for a bit of time. And uh, come back uh, pretty fine. Uh, the and then suddenly on the third day, uh, the same amount of exposure will um, make me profoundly ill, which is what happened uh, while I was on air, and I was very lucky to have made it through the transmission at all last Saturday. Uh, my dry heaving, which was uh, very much symptomatic of sun sickness for me, uh, was actually audible, and uh, I know that much. That, that has been confirmed by a number of people. It might have sounded uh, like a kind of pause. Or, or belching, or I'm not quite sure how it transmitted across the bandwidth, uh, but it was certainly impacting myself and my ability to maintain any thread of thought, which I'm going to try to do today in terms of elucidating uh, upon the positions that I brought forth last time. Uh, the majority of things I talked about, or a number of them, I want to first thank, of course, the two lovely ladies that make it possible for me to be here at all, particularly, of course, Laura Lee Solomon, without whom it's impossible for me to be here, uh, executrix producer, and of course, she's given me the loud and clear, very much appreciated. And of course, uh, halfway across the globe, we're getting a loud and clear from uh, the beautiful Garden Island of Kauai, uh, where our uh, co-productive correspondent, Judith Ager, uh, Princess of the Pacific, dwells. And uh, Laura Lee Solomon herself, of course, I do encourage people to provide her as much moral and, if possible, fiscal support as possible. We'll talk about that uh, during the promotions. And, of course, I continue to ask for such for myself as well uh, because of the number of uh, stresses that I'm going through right now in uh, a number of ways. And I uh, don't need to go into the details right now. Uh, I thank those who are trying to help and I encourage others to do so uh, because I am most certainly not paid uh, to be here. And uh, I definitely am here, of course, uh, in, in terms of uh, service to yourself. And uh, it's the service to yourself, of course, that earns me the hatred and the assaults that I get uh, incessantly. Uh, and those same assaults affected uh, my executrix producer to the point where she had to move again and again. And uh, is uh, now, of course, in, in, in a different place of relocation. That's how serious this has been on her. So her loyalty and her uh, suffering with me in this is uh, unprecedented, uh, very much the equivalent of a wife. And I uh, want to, of course, emphasize that there's a certain aspect uh, to both Saturday and today uh, in terms of uh, official state holidays in the sense that, of course, uh, the um, April 20th uh, was, of course, Hitler Day in the Third Reich, which was an official state holiday. It is obviously no longer honored or celebrated on the surface world in Hochdeutschland, or High Germany, uh, as it's known uh, to people in Unterland. Uh, it is, of course, uh, something that very few people know about in the United States, other than, uh, for instance, uh, every once in a while some uh, incident will take place like the Columbine Massacre, which becomes equated in the minds of Americans with Hitler Day and adds to a sense of ominousness to ignorant Americans. Uh, and uh, today, uh, this Tuesday, is officially, in a sense, uh, certainly in the state of Mississippi, uh, a Confederate Memorial Day. And uh, it is obviously a controversial uh, stance 
for certain states to take. And it, it appears that several of the former Confederate states of America have different days which they consider uh, as Confederate Memorial Day. Now, um, I, I remember this was the day of the attack of uh, Tecumseh, Alabama, or maybe it fell to Union troops, or there was a serious siege that was put into effect on this day. Uh, other than that, I'm not quite sure exactly why this day would be chosen. Um, it, uh, it is not necessarily similar to what would, say, if the Confederate States of America had seceded and uh, successfully done so, um, there would uh, almost certainly be the version of Fourth of July, which would be Secesh Day or Secessionary uh, Day, the Day of Secession, which I assume would be either the day that uh, the legal uh, Declaration of Independence was placed before uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, the President of the Confederate States of America, or the um, day of the um, uh, the commencement of hostilities at Fort Sumter. Uh, I don't believe either of those days was today, if I remember correctly, and I. Uh, think that, um, that there are different reasons in different states why they kind of honor uh, their um, Confederate past on uh, their particular dates. But this is the date that I remember most conveniently. And it is also uh, the reason I do remember it is because it's coeval or coextant with Anzac Day in Australia. Uh, now, of course, there's plenty of reasons uh, for me to uh, hate individuals in Australia, such as, of course, my gang stalker, Stephen Outrim, the Aquino acolyte, uh, the multimillionaire who um, I proposed uh, for myself to have sex with him while in drag. Uh, for a million dollars, which I refused. And uh, there are, of course, uh, acolytes of his or uh, people who he employs uh, on Facebook to spread confusion or, uh, or, or disreputation uh, via just uh, misleads uh, via various links uh, to uh, sites that are created to confuse people or uh, to uh, try and discredit myself. Uh, this kind of effort has gone on uh, for so long, of course, that it's quite easy for a person to fall into a pattern, especially with my uh, experience of victimization in Australia, uh, where, of course, I was set up by the uh, people of uh, Nexus magazine, uh, brought over there where, of course, uh, they uh, stole everything that I had uh, via the uh, Virgin Australia. Uh, there has never been any com uh, compensation for it. What uh, was offered monetarily, of course, uh, it did absolutely nothing to compensate myself, and it was all stolen by my former manager, Lorian Ann Fenton, anyway. Uh, so it's uh, I, I've, I've certainly no personal reason to ever return to Australia again. Uh, of course, never say never. It depends on uh, what conditions it's under. Either it would be by abduction or conquest or something absolutely bizarre or uh, unfathomable at this point in the uh, chronology. Uh, other than uh, something so extreme, I can't foresee myself returning to Australia for any good reason. I certainly don't recommend it for anyone else. Uh, it's a dangerous place. It's full of white people. But nevertheless, uh, historical credit does need to be given on Anzac Day to the Australian uh, fighting forces. Uh, very important to remember that of all the allied powers, uh, that is, of course, particularly in comparison to the British or the Americans, uh, the um, highest uh, combat respectability or the highest kill ratio, uh, combat capability of all the Allied forces uh, was uh, displayed by the Australians. The Australian forces proved themselves the most combat effective of all Allied forces of World War II. And aside from stellar battle performance, it must be remembered that Australia alone among all combatant nations on either side, Axis or Allied, enforced no conscription because none was needed. All they had were volunteers. Uh, one in every two Australian males aged 18 through 45 years of age enlisted voluntarily. Uh, at the peak of hostilities, nigh 89 and a half percent, about 90 percent uh, of all Australian males aged 14 years and over were in the services are directly employed in war work, including the manufacture of their own indigenous tank forces, their own indigenous armored uh, vehicles. So uh, certainly credit must be given and, uh, and the deepest of respect uh, was uh, provided uh, to them by the Japanese. And in, the, in, and in turn, the Australians uh, provided that respect to the Japanese in turn. In a sense, this is not to say, of course, that the racial hatred uh, between both antagonists was not uh, so extreme 
that Australians uh, it, it did shoot down uh, Japanese medical planes, for instance, uh, medical craft uh, bearing the Japanese version of the Red Cross, which, uh, of course, was the Green Cross in Japan, uh, which was all entirely owned, ultimately, by Emperor Hirohito, the Green Cross uh, forces. And it was under his private ownership that negotiations with the Americans, when the Americans sued for peace, you can historically vet this, you can look this up yourself, uh, in order to prevent uh, American uh, shootdown of any Japanese aircraft uh, coming in for negotiation with the Americans as the Americans sued for peace, Emperor Hirohito ordered personally his Green Cross uh, painted on all Japanese aircraft and vehicles so that uh, the to replace the rising sun or the uh, the mon as it's known in Japan, what Americans would call the meatball, so that negotiations could perform smoothly uh, when Americans or other allies saw uh, incoming vehicles with the Green Cross upon them. Uh, at that point, of course, orders went to all Allied forces not to shoot down Japanese medical uh, craft at that point, and uh, which was never applied before, believe it or not, throughout the war. Uh, Americans, Australians, and all such uh, combatants were urged to shoot down Japanese uh, medical uh, vehicles. Uh, this would include the Awamaru, which was a Japanese Red Cross vehicle. And uh, this was uh, a, a vehicle that was loaded with thousands of women and children evacuating. We know this because their bodies washed up on the nation in which I was born, on the beaches of Taiwan. And uh, it was sunk by an American submarine, and the man who sunk it was given a promotion by the Americans because they were encouraging the shootdown of Japanese medical craft. So at that point in history, in order to differentiate all the Allied orders, because they were the ones losing the war, went to not shoot down such craft. And uh, that's when, why Emperor Hirohito ordered, of course, uh, the painting of the Green Cross to uh, expedite negotiations as uh, the ceasefire commenced. It was important to remember the ceasefire was not even recognized till long after that chicken shit little circus of uh, Douglas MacArthur on the battleship Missouri. Uh, that uh, the uh, your United States government does not recognize that as a surrender of the Japanese at all. And uh, that's very important to remember because you can check it out with um, uh, the, um, uh, of course, the uh, Code 38, um, uh, Article 38 of the U.S. Code, uh, which shows that uh, World War II did not end, of course, until uh, into ceasefire, did not enter ceasefire until uh, the um, uh, 31st of December in 1946, the year after 1945, uh, basically a year and uh, well over a year and a half after the so-called surrender ceremony, of which, of course, the emperor uh, snubbed and was not even a part of. So uh, very important to, uh, to look up everything I say as it reinforces everything I say, of course, as uh, truth. Uh, again, that's Title 38 of the United States Code, Title 38. And um, one of the uh, things that uh, we will um, kind of just recover briefly, uh, because this is kind of a uh, controversial uh, memory day, uh, a day of memorial, uh, and it's important to at least acknowledge this, no matter what your ethnicity. Uh, it's important to remember uh, people often don't understand, of course, my confluence of a uh, condemnation of chattel slavery, uh, my advocacy for African-American rights, and yet my ability to uh, respect the memory of, say, for instance, the Confederate States of America. It uh, has to come with the fact that I have, of course, Irish blood in myself. And it's very important to remember that the American war between the states or uh, the North American war between two separate North American nations, the Confederate States of America and the United States of America, was a race war. It was a war uh, between two separate ethnicities who were as separate uh, in their cultural orientations as that of the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish as opposed to the Anglo-Saxons of England. Uh, one merely has to watch films such as Braveheart or Rob Roy uh, speaking, which we speak to the Scottish struggle uh, for independence against English conquest uh, to understand the race hatred between two people who are indistinguishable 
uh, to other ethnicities across the globe. Uh, so you see two white people who both speak the same language, uh, English as enforced upon the Scots, uh, who, of course, uh, as their lingua franca to this day, do not speak uh, Scottish Gaelic uh, as the norm for the communications, though that may change if they gain independence and re-educate their, their children of future generations. Uh, everything is open to renewal as uh, the recovery of the Hebrew language uh, by the Turkic descended Hazar peoples out of Eastern Europe who settled into occupation of Palestine, uh, recovered the Hebrew language to give themselves a patinia of uh, legitimacy in terms of their occupation over Palestine. Uh, so too the Scots can recover their long lost language. So too can the Irish eventually uh, recover their own uh, Irish Gaelic. Uh, but uh, for the most part, my understanding uh, from many modern or uh, postmodern Irish peoples is that people who speak Gaelic are usually considered um, dangerous to hang around with. They're usually members of the IRA, Irish Republican Army, uh, and therefore it's it's kind of looked on askance uh, to to speak the uh, the Gaelic language uh, too publicly or too aggressively. Uh, things may have changed, and uh, I, I'll leave it to Irish people such as Neil Parkinson. Shout out to him of uh, the uh, Gothic Dark Arts, or I'll have to remember the name of his private studio. But Neil Parkinson is his name. N I A L L. Uh, and uh, or is it now Davidson? Um, I, I'm so sorry if I don't remember his name correctly either. My apologies. At any rate, he knows of whom I speak and he can provide me corrections later and I'll bring it up on air next time. Uh, but he's in Ireland. He can catch me up on what's going on over there. In the meantime, what I can speak to historically is that uh, the North or the Union States were overwhelmingly Anglo-Teutonic, uh, Anglo-Dutch in origin, and uh, they had the Puritan Protestant work ethic, they had industrialization. The South, however, was overwhelmingly Gallo-Celtic, and uh, as the uh, Celtic peoples, they had a very different work ethic. Um, one would say a non-existent work ethic. Uh, this is why you have such high uh, rates of unemployment in the South, very similar to um, what you have in, in some ways in Ireland for a long period of time, though Ireland is one of the stronger economies in terms of a, in terms of a new economy or emergent economy in Europe. It's, a, it's of course, a European uh, member nation, and very proudly so. The arguments are still on in terms of Brexit as to whether Northern and Southern Ireland are going to have either a hard or South or soft border, believe it or not. So there, there is still their version of the Berlin Wall or the Great Wall of Trump, uh, a la Mexico, uh, that is coming up as a subject uh, th that's almost un unknown in the United States. Some a new challenge that they have to deal with because many people are defecting. Many people in England are trying to get Irish passports as, as soon as possible because they know they're going to uh, be left in the dirt with Brexit and uh, and as it uh, crumbles all of England into a morbid depression, which will last for generations unless, of course, they follow the type of advice that I'll be happy to bring up in uh, future transmissions about uh, uh, restarting an empire, but in a beneficial manner, uh, something that would benefit all peoples. I'll just summarize it here and now. And I've said it before, um, you have the uh, Rothschild family, uh, which, of course, has uh, baronial tendencies, uh, meaning that they have a barony in England and in Austria. Uh, in other words, they are royal. They are of royal uh, recognition. Uh, they can easily be coronated into kinghood over the kingdom of Israel. Uh, and that is what you would need would be a recognition by the British monarchy of uh, Israel as a monarchy, a co-monarchy and a co-dominium of monarchy uh, that uh, would be uh, in uh, co-rulership with England. And uh, you would also recognize uh, the uh, various regal heads of state and support them throughout the Arab nations. Now, the British could actually do this because the overwhelming majority of the Arab high command and the overwhelming majority of Arab nations is trained at Sandhurst uh, outside of London. And uh, the um, overwhelming majority of uh, Arab officers speak the King's English. They, they, they speak uh, better English than most Americans I've ever met. Great example of this, of course, would be His Highness the King of Jordan, uh, who, of course, attended Sandhurst, as has all his family. Uh, obviously, I've said the uh, House of Saud needs to be unseated. They are now a puppet uh, of the United States, as the United States was a long time a puppet of theirs. 
and uh, they need to be unseated, pushed into exile. Uh, the house of uh, the Hashimi dynasty, that of the kingdom of Jordan, needs to be uh, in place as the protectors of the holiest sites in Islam, al Mecca and al Medina, uh, throughout all the Arabian Peninsula. And of course, uh, they um, w- this would uh, make everyone in the Arab world much happier uh, and less prone towards uh, terrorism as an act of political uh, recourse, uh, because these were the people whose uh, family gave birth to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, and were the original protectors of Islam until they were unseated by the British in their support of the uh, Saudis. So they need to just reverse history, uh, reclaim righteousness. Uh, this would bring peace uh, through British participation actively in both Israel and the Arab world. And with a united Arab, North Africa and Southwest Asia and a uh, kingdom of Israel, uh, the uh, British would be able to maintain control over all of Southwest Asia and to North Africa and bring peace to uh, so many of the intractable Middle Eastern problems that we have uh, by accepting both the uh, Israelis and the Palestinians into their commonwealth, uh, thereby providing peacekeeping. And uh, this would be the solution. I could go into it in depth, uh, but I remember how angry most uh, Americans are because Americans, of course, are batshit ignorant and crazy and proud of it. Uh, I would be attacked on YouTube for such, uh, you know, uh, suggestions uh, by advisements uh, by people saying, so you want to give Israel to the Rothschilds? You are the pawn of Satan, the son of the devil himself. It's a terrible. Well, the last time I checked, I, I think the Rothschilds are Jewish. I mean, uh, that's the case, isn't it? I mean, I'm being facetious here. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, the Rothschilds did help with uh, sponsorship uh, and finance to bring about the state of Israel. Uh, the uh, Rothschilds, other than certain members of the family, the main head, the man who would become the king of Israel, if coronated, the Baron Rothschild, has never visited Israel, never set ground uh, foot in it because he uh, was disgusted by the Zionist extremism. These are conservatives. These are people who would take Israel in a direction of uh, conservative development as opposed to militant expansion. Uh, so uh, this is uh, something that needs to be uh, explored. And uh, it, of course, Douglas Dietrich suggested it, the modern Israeli. And uh, no one else ever has. And that's a, that's on record. So uh, as for the Confederate peoples, uh, important to remember uh, the Civil War was a war of racial genocide against this white minority, uh, the uh, Celtic minorities of the uh, Confederate states, the rulers, of course, uh, as a class over the majority black population, but very important always to remember the majority of Confederates, soldiers, and uh, and the majority of even officers were not slave owners. Uh, The slave owners were the privileged uh, plantation estate holders. Many of them provided for the officer class, and many of them, of course, uh, provided uh, the politicians uh, and uh, the people in the field uh, are to be honored for a struggle, but not uh, the slave owners who uh, manipulated them. And ultimately, one of them uh, being, of course, the most despicable of all, in my opinion, Robert E. Lee, who, of course, didn't care uh, about selling out the South and not retreating into guerrilla warfare, which would have ultimately ironed out as all of the slaves had been freed by the North, so to speak, uh, or shall we say the majority. Obviously, they were kept in slavery, uh, which was legal in the North, wherever the North occupied, such as New Orleans and the uh, Louisiana area, where the army of the United States needed slaves to maintain their logistics and their uh, and, and, and just all of the feeding of the troops, uh, caring for them, etc. This was done by black, black Southern slaves. And uh, they, of course, experimented on them, brought many of them to the island of Navassa, which is off limits to anyone to this day, in guard, under guard by the Coast Guard 24 hours a day. Anyone who gets within miles of it is blown out of the water because Navasa was where they took a number of those African slaves to conduct inhuman experiments on. The United States did, not the Confederate States. And of course, uh, so um, the, the Union was very pragmatic, very hypocritical about, quote unquote, freeing the slaves. But with the Emancipation Proclamation acting as a subversive element, the slaves would have ultimately migrated in Moss up north, where unfortunately they would have been exploited by uh, by union corporations and industry as wage slaves working for uh, food 
practically for all intents and purposes. But the South would have become more and more of a white nation, and ultimately it would have been independent had guerrilla war been conducted. You cannot win a guerrilla war. Uh, and uh, Robert E. Lee put an end to all this and sold out and basically sold his own comfort, uh, his own uh, retirement in ease. Uh, he purchased that by selling out the South. So it's very important to remember he has no one to admire. Uh, uh, Neo-Confederates who admire him are in incredibly ignorant, as they are about so many other things, and that's the tragedy of their ignorance. And so, uh, important to remember uh, the Celtic uh, ethne, ethnos of the Confederate States did survive, and uh, they are welcome to secede at this point. Uh, their states will look much different. They will be along county lines, uh, ethnically divided, and therefore we can have a black southern uh, independent New Africa and a white independent new Confederate States of America at some point in the near future, which would have both uh, ethno states separate but equal. Uh, there will be some border gore in the sense of uh, dividing lines not being that discernible or easily clear cut, uh, but this is the reality that you faced in places such as Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where I served as a mercenary in combat, and uh, there were dividing lines that were equally uh, hard on the eye in terms of mapping, uh, but nevertheless could functionally have uh, continued and do functionally continue, albeit they've taken them off the maps officially. And what you see now is this long triangle shape uh, known as Bosnia on the map, which is not how it functions on the ground. You have divisions on the ground. Uh, we don't need to be that denying of reality in the United States. You can have uh, a set for Confederate states, which would do absolutely no economic damage to lose to the United States, and a separate New Africa, which also would do no economic damage to the United States to lose. Both of these could trade and economically better themselves in conduct and alliance with the United States, and it would work out just fine. And uh, so in terms of uh, the Confederate Memorial Day, those are thoughts that are worth having. And it brings us to uh, Patriot's Day, which I brought up uh, last time I was on air and deathly sick uh, and dry heaving on air. Uh, that uh, why it's not celebrated either as a national holiday. The shots heard around the world, which inspired not only the revolution in the United States, but revolutions all over the world, all modern revolutions, the communist Chinese revolution, the Bolshevik revolution of Russia, the Meiji restoration revolution of the emperor in Japan who defeated the samurai with the European trained peasant army. All of these are revolutions inspired by the American revolution, the French revolution of Napoleon Bonaparte that produced him, made him emperor, a centrist Revol a centrist emperor. He was a centrist uh, who emerged out of the left-wing uh, extremism of the French Revolution that anticipated and inspired Karl Marx and the communist revolutions of Russia and China, etc. Uh, the French Revolution, none of this would have happened without the American Revolution. And yet, as I was saying, Every other nation you go to, which hits you over the head with their revolutions, their memorials, uh, their uh, revolutionary holidays, such as uh, France's, uh, what Americans ignorantly call Bastille Day. Uh, and, uh, of course, which is the birthday of my uh, executrix producer, mind you, is on that uh, very day. Um, all of this is something you don't have in America. You have a 4th of July is a, a celebration of American uh, independence, but not its revolution, not its subversion, even though it was until World War II, the longest war in American history, lasting eight years of Vietnam-styled insurgency and counterinsurgency on the part of the British. Why do you not have the militia aspect of the holiday celebrated April 19th? Uh, well, it was, in a sense, uh, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That was the day he lifted America off the gold standard in 1933 and demanded everyone turn in their gold as part of a patriotic tithe. Uh, all the gold they had, even the private coin collections, and the Americans were stupid enough to follow up in the main and uh, gave all their gold to the United States government, which stole it. Uh, which is why gold is so hard to get today, one of the reasons why uh, gold is so treasured in the United States. And uh, all of that was stolen by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who thereafter took America off the gold standard and uh, turned the United States dollar into fiat currency, which he could, by which he could attempt to print the United States out of the Great Depression with. And uh, that was why, because it was the only liquid currency in the world at the time, every other currency being weighted down, tied down, uh, solidly uh, weighted on the gold standard, 
he was able to uh, convince the more reckless economies of the world who had enormous amounts of resources to expend and splurge, such as the Soviet Union, uh, the British Empire, the French who ruled uh, a great deal of the world under the Republic, uh, the Dutch, and uh, all of these colonial empires. He convinced them to uh, fix their currencies to the U.S. dollar. So uh, the nations which refused to do that and stuck to the gold standard, the Japanese, the Germans, the Italians, these became the Axis nations. That was the whole reason for World War II. Uh, those who were willing to uh, make themselves slave-circuited to the American economy and those who wanted their independence. So, of course, always remember the Axis were the good guys. Now, in terms of uh, all of this, when we speak of uh, that, um, what was done on that day, Patriot's Day, you can understand now the painful memories of Patriot's Day, why it's not celebrated, why no one celebrates it, why it's a holiday of pain to the American people, though no one consciously remembers why. And, of course, it's on that day that we experienced, ultimately, the uh, Ruby Ridge uh, incident. It's on that day which we experienced uh, the uh, Waco massacre. It's on that day which we experienced the bombing of the Oklahoma City uh, Federal Building. Uh, all of these uh, happened on April 19th. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it's a day of horror. It, 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 and it goes to show the true legacy of the shots heard around the world. What came of them? Uh, the overwhelming majority of all the revolutions that followed were profoundly negative. Uh, the first regime uh, installed in uh, France of uh, the, the, the first republic were, were there far, by far, it, it was by far its most criminal regime, far more so than Vichy France under the National Socialist East of Le Theodore Reich. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I, I need to qualify and expand on even that. It's important to remember that the Vichy France were so uh, Judeophobic, so uh, prosecutive of the Jews that they forced the, 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 I'm not exaggerating this, you can verify this yourself, they forced the National Socialist of the Third Reich to take on people that they did not even consider Jews uh, and take them into camps and ultimately take them to their death in on trains and rails leading to the Totenslagen or the death camps in Eastern Europe. So uh, the Vichy French took the uh, German race laws to extremes to eliminate anyone that they disliked uh, that the Germans themselves were not willing to consider under their own laws to be Jews and persecute them, take them uh, away and ethnically cleanse France of its Jewry. Uh, so the French today uh, are, of course, heirs to that legacy and, and uh, of course, that responsibility. I don't call it a guilt uh, because the Germans are no more guilty for what they did than the Americans consider themselves guilty for the hundred million people they killed in World War I by unleashing the so-called Spanish flu, nor do the British consider themselves guilty for the uh, hundred million that they killed in World War II in India by the mass famines generated under orders of Winston Churchill, nor do the Russians consider themselves guilty for all of this Stalinist genocide. Uh, if all of these allied pieces of shit and uh, the overwhelming majority of people on the Allies kiss my ass. If you identify with them, you're a piece of shit. And, uh, it, it, and I'll say it to your face. Uh, you aren't worth shit. And uh, it, it, the Axis stood for what is right. And uh, the National Socialists were very proud of the number of uh, Jews that they killed, considering it a service to humanity. And, of course, they would tell you they killed 12 million, not the 6 million that the Jews uh, will assert because the Jews exclude half of the Nazi kill count because of the fact that they consider the uh, people the Nazis counted as Jews uh, of the matri uh, since they were adding both the patrilineal and the matrilineal uh, descent to their calculations. Uh, the Jewish people themselves have a sense of exclusivity that it's only through the matrilineal line that someone can be considered a Jew. So they've halved that number that they, of course, uh, promote to the world. Uh, so they're not wrong. Uh, they are lying uh, for reasons, of course, that are incomprehensible to anyone outside of their exclusive uh, ethnostatic 
uh, ethnostatist mentality. Uh, but uh, that's the reality that we have in this world today. Uh, so all of that uh, needs to be taken into account. And uh, of course, this is part of the Holocaust denial stupidity and that of the neo-Nazis who deny that which they're, uh, the people that they speak of, the original National Socialists, would consider one of their greatest accomplishments. And of course, it's important to remember those same National Socialists were not prosecutive, were not persecuting uh, Zionists who ultimately, of course, uh, were trying uh, to establish a state outside of Europe which is exactly what the National Socialist were, uh, were encouraging. Therefore, they received state sponsorship from the Third Reich, the uh, Zionists, uh, to ultimately infiltrate Palestine. This was at the time when Moshe Dayan uh, and so many of the Jewish heroes of the uh, establishment of the State of Israel uh, were considered Nazi terrorists by the British High Command went back in the days when Moshe Dayan and other people like that were blowing up British hotels. Uh, so, uh, all of, I, I, important to remember, they, uh, the Zionist Jews of Israel were considered uh, Nazis, Nazi insurgents. Uh, the establishment of the State of Israel was one of Adolf Hitler's greatest victories, along with his maintenance of Franco as the fascist uh, leader of Falange Spain, uh, well into the 1970s, uh, 80s, whenever it was that uh, his eminence, uh, Francisco Franco, died. Uh, until then, you had an honest-to-God, full-fledged national socialist state in the middle of Europe, uh, uh, bordering the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, a uh, member of NATO that had its own death camps and uh, various uh, concentration camps operating all the way through the 70s into the 80s, thanks to uh, Adolf Hitler's unacknowledged victory uh, in the West, which which no one ever speaks of, uh, as if Spain didn't exist. So um, uh, all those thoughts come to mind. And with those thoughts on this Confederate Memorial Day, we speak of state rights, of course. Uh, and uh, I have stated in the past, of course, the fallacy of that argument of the neo-Confederates uh, is uh, the uh, ignorance of the fact that they were fighting a race war. Uh, and that needs to be educated to everyone in the United States. This was a war that was equivalent to the British attempt at ethnically cleansing via genocide the Celtic fringe of the British Isles, of uh, the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, core of the British Isles. Their attempt to exterminate the Welsh, the Scots, the Irish uh, over hundreds of years was attempted within a few short years by the United States of America against the Celtic fringe of North America, the Confederate States. And... Uh, mm, if you don't understand the American uh, Civil War between the states on, in that light, you don't understand it at all. And, um, and uh, the neo-Confederates don't. Uh, they view it as something states' rights. Okay, and as I've emphasized before, states don't have rights. People have rights. This brings us to the gun rights issue. As I've said, guns don't have rights. People have rights. And that brings us to the media rights issue. Uh, media does not have rights. People have rights. Now, what's in common with all of these things? A right to live, a right to live in freedom. With states' rights, you had, of course, the laws of Chattel slavery. Some of those laws were not repealed until so recently. It's unbelievable. Uh, the 1980s, some of them maybe by the year 2004 in some states in the Confederate, former Confederate states of America uh, concerning slavery. Uh, slavery was still legal on the books in those states, state by state. And this was state rights. And that, of course, was antithetical in terms of their laws to human rights. So uh, that's easy enough to understand. So, too, with gun rights. We all have a right, just as we have a right not to be chattel slaves uh, on a plantation. We all have a right to live and not be killed by some psychotic white trash piece of shit waving a machine gun. That's why you have rights to shove down the throats of a gun cultist or a firearms fetishist. And they can go take their M16 or their AR-15 and any other automatic weapon that they have, shove it up their ass, turn it on full auto, and blow their own intestines out through their mouth. And, uh, it, and I would laugh while they were uh, doing such. Media rights is the same way. Media does not have right. You do not have a right to free speech. And uh, it, we, ha we need, of course, as with gun safety reform, we need lingua safety reform. 
lingua control, control, word control is what you would call it, but it's actually lingua safety reform. Now, all of this is something I'm going to go into because, of course, we have a situation where the Malaysian government is uh, now uh, going to pass a law for 10-year prison sentences for pushing fake news. Now, I've used them as an example. They are uh, an inspiration, albeit in the negative sense. Uh, Their bill, uh, which is uh, threatening uh, anyone who promotes uh, fake news with 10-year prison sentences and hefty fines, is set to pass in August, if I uh, if I remember correctly, in time for the August election. So I, I believe it's actually already passed. Uh, but in Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia, uh, the Prime Minister Najib Razak's government tabled this bill in Parliament that outlawed fake news. Uh, Ten years in jail. Uh, the amount of the fine was five hundred thousand ringgit. Uh, ring it, which is uh, about $128,140 exactly, if you calculate it pedantically. And uh, that would be, or you could get both. And uh, the act seeks to safeguard the public against the proliferation of fake news, while still supposedly ensuring the right to freedom of speech and and expression under the federal constitution of Malaysia, of course. And um, though it defines fake news as news, information, data, or reportings, which is or are wholly or partly false and includes features, visuals, and audio recordings by which this is disseminated. And the law covers digital publications, social media, uh, applies to offenders outside of Malaysia, including foreigners, as long as Malaysia or a Malaysian citizen is affected. So uh, it, the bill states it, it's hoped the public will be more responsible and cautious in sharing news and information. Now, of course, there's opposition to this. Uh, it's an attack on the press, according to people against it, and an attempt to instill fear amongst uh, uh, the citizens of Malaysia uh, before their uh term for this year's election, which is called GE14. I don't know what that acronym is for. Uh, But uh, the reality is that this is all instigated by the 1MDB scandal. Now, 1MDB is a Malaysian acronym uh, for a uh, some kind of company that the prime minister, Najib Razak, was involved with that was basically uh, swindling funds. So this is corruption on a massive scale uh, to the highest level of the president himself, who, of course, is determined to be reelected. So uh, the um, uh, the one MDB, uh, it uh, was exposed by foreign media and news blogs uh, in 2015, uh, a fairly long time ago. Uh, and it refuses to die down despite Najib's consistent denials of any wrongdoing and his government's firm grip on Malaysia's mainly state-owned mainstream media. Uh, and the transactions under 1MDB, they're uh, under investigation in six countries, including the United States, which is why they made this law applicable to foreigners. And the Department of Justice here in the United States has launched civil cases to recover assets linked to the fund after investigations under an anti-kleptocracy initiative, meaning an antithetical to a government run by thieves, which is what you've got now in Russia under Vladimir Putin and in the United States under Donald Trump. Now, uh, the Malaysian government, of course, has acted harshly against the uh, um, media reporting on 1MDB. It's suspended one newspaper I know of, The Edge. Uh, I can't remember the Malaysian word for it. In 2015, it blocked other websites for publishing stories critical of Najib's role. And uh, the uh, deputy minister was quoted in Malaysian media saying that any news on 1MDB that had not been verified by his government was fake news. Uh, So the corruption here is obvious. And uh, this would be a threat to free expression. Uh, But uh, the criminalization of fake news, uh, of course, human rights uh, groups are advocating it be um, uh, withdrawn. Uh, I do remember now the acronym for 1MDB. It's One Malaysia Development Bihard, uh, Berhad, uh, um, First Malaysian Development Berhad, which might be a bank or something. I can't remember what that translated into. Uh, but uh, because of this um, uh, broad uh, non-definition of what fake news is, it's up to the Malaysian government to decide what and what is not the fake news. Uh, so um, the Malaysian government, it has been argued by outsiders, has no monopoly on truth. 
uh, but it's attempting to be the arbiter of what can and can't be said and written. Now, this is obviously from a moral standpoint um, reprehensible. At the same time, uh, there are elements of it that need to be uh, brought to bear here in the United States with our own constitutional reform, our uh, rewriting of the Constitution on the basis of national security and cultural coherency. So as an example of that, I would go back to um, the original uh, perpetrators of fake news uh, that, as we understood them in the English language. Uh, and uh, that was back in the days when you had people who were driven blind or mad, literally went insane on the basis of fake news. Now, how does this happen? Well, a great example is uh, the brew and ale industry in uh, the British Isles. If we go back to the British Isles, you've got a group of white trash pieces of shit who are so ignorant that when a bunch of monkeys uh, crashed on the uh, on the beach, uh, they thought they were French spies. They thought that French people looked like that. They, they, that's this what they thought French people looked like. This is not urban legend. This is not, there is a monkey tavern in Britain which honors this very incident or, or commemorates it. I don't know if honor is the right word for it or, or remembers it. And it's not in Lampoon. This is what really happened. Uh, the uh, French ha ship had a bunch of monkeys uh, heading towards the Paris Zoo. Uh, the French ship got caught in a storm. Uh, the cage that was full of monkeys washed up on the British beach. All the monkeys survived. Uh, the British thought this is what French people looked like, and they put them on trial as spies and saboteurs and executed all of them. Uh, that, that's British for you. That's British intelligence. Well, these are the kind of people who, uh, when they encountered uh, India and Asia, picked up a hell of a tea habit uh, because of caffeine. They could actually uh, stimulate British sloth into doing some work and thereby kind of live up to their Protestant work ethic, uh, which you didn't have in the Deep South because everybody was Irish and Welsh and Scottish and shit. And uh, that's why they had all the slaves do all the work while the white guys were kind of kicking back. You know, they would do the fighting, right? You know, and uh, th this was the kind of warlord mentality that came out of the Celtic past. Uh, and um, and uh, it, 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 there's traits to everything that are admirable and traits to everything that are not. <laughs> and in the case of the British... Uh, where there's always very little to be found that's admirable. <laughs> you have a uh, case where they became more and more Protestant and puritanical uh, based on caffeine, which they apparently had never run into before, and uh, the tea was being uh, brought into England uh, in great big bulk shipments as they plundered Asia. And the brew and ale industry, the home-grown industry of Britain, was uh, understandably threatened. So what they did was they hired propagandists, doctors, and think about what I just said. They hired propagandists and they hired MDs, uh, medicine and a doctor. We're not talking hacks, actual MDs, to tell the British people that tea was bad for you, that tea would drive you blind or mad, that you would go insane drinking tea. Now, if you disbelieve me, just look up a short story written at the time. There's a short story titled Green Tea. And in this short story, you have a British professor who's of high intellectual capacity who becomes addicted to the caffeine buzz of green tea, kind of like what I'm sucking right now, and uh, as a result uh, goes increasingly insane mm. and um, basically begins to hallucinate. Um, he's at a lectern uh, speaking before a group of students when a green monkey uh, begins to appear on his podium and he tries to uh, chase the green monkey away with his cane, whereon everyone begins to notice his madness, and it just goes downhill from there. Uh, so people who read that short story uh, said, oh God, that's happening to me. So you had people seeing green monkeys everywhere while drinking green tea. Uh, you had people uh, committing suicide, jumping out of uh, uh, third story windows and shit uh, because they were driven mad by tea. Oh, it, he's had too much tea, uh, tried to kill himself, or uh, commit murders on tea. This, this was all happening. This, this all happened. This is the effect of propaganda on a ignorant public. And, uh, of course, this is what we have today in so many respects replaying itself. At this moment in the history of the information revolution, a significant number of Americans, it's possible to know how many, some of them come onto my timeline on Facebook, believe that a video circulating on the web shows Hillary Clinton and Huma Ebdin slicing the face off a small child. The lie is gruesome.
but it's far from extraordinary. Fake news is rampant. Uh, that phrase has lost its significance more or less the moment it was coined. If anyone uses it, if they're your husband or, or wife, your spouse, divorce them. <laughs> if they're your father or mother or son dis or, or, or daughter, disown them uh, because it means nothing more than the other side's news, other people's news. That's what fake news means. Uh, the news made by the other team. So the if someone uses that term, like some idiot on my Facebook timeline when I presented something in satire, the term uh, is satire when you have a political joke. It is not fake news, uh, which implies that I'm trying to promote it as fact. This is the stupidity of Americans. They take everything to a nuclear level in a conventional war or uh, something which isn't even confrontational, and they take it into confrontation. That is what fake news is. That is a confrontational term. You're being told you're a liar. So if anyone disrespects you that way, block them, disown them. If necessary, of course, uh, physically uh, remove them <laughs> from your vicinity. Now, the information infrastructure that a generation has spent its time on Earth building has been twisted into this vast, prolific distortion machine. And the power of distortion is growing. And uh, so you have this uh, last week, BuzzFeed released as a uh, it, just as a warning, a highly convincing clip in which President Obama apparently calls Donald Trump a total and complete dipshit. Jordan Peele did the voice work. You have never been able to trust anything you read. You are now unable to believe anything you hear or see either. Uh, falsehood flies. Truth comes limping after. Jonathan Swift wrote that in 1710. Uh, recent examples of Swift's truism are far too easy to come by. On Twitter, a cardiologist claimed that a video of Syrian children dying from poison gas was fake because the electrocardiogram pads were misplaced. His initial post received more than 12,000 retweets. His subsequent admission of error received fewer than 50. In the aftermath of the 2016 election, the Pew Research Center revealed what may be the most disturbing number of the whole sordid election, which was hacked, of course. Trump is not your president. And the most disturbing aspect of that was that 14% of Americans admitted they shared a story they knew was fake at the time to help make Donald Trump president. So people actively spread falsehoods. Do people who do such even deserve the truth? Let them wallow in their ignorance. Let them believe the earth is flat and that Donald Trump is a legitimate president. People like this need to be deported. Now, that's the difference between, say, for instance, what a young man, uh, J. Mo Reese, shout out to him, suggested is that, um, well, why stop with the Republicans? Why not the neo-Nazis as opposed to giving them a white homeland in the Pacific Northwest? Why not the neo-Confederates rather than letting them stay where they are? Why not? All of those populations, as well as the population of Republicans who are at this point in history, treasonous Russian insurgents, uh, because the difference with the other people is that they are open and honest about their exclusivity. The, it is the old Serbian saying, I'm a member of the Serbian Orthodox Church, the old Serbian saying is better to have a German as an enemy than an Italian as a friend. And the reason for that is, of course, Italy switches sides in wars. It's done this because of a Machiavellian uh, cultural matrix. And as a result, there's no shame or disgrace nationally in what Italy does for its survival. That is the Machiavellian uh, matrix. And uh, in terms of the Germans, they are steadfast in their loyalty, steadfast in their stance, and uh, even if genocidal are honorable in that regard, this is why the Totengofferbande, the Deshead Camp Guards, the Nazi concentration camp executioners who were able to annihilate women and children and take their cadavers and feed them into the ovens uh, to ultimately convert the ash into diamonds that were used to finance the massive exodus of many Nordic Aryans into Unterland. This is why they were one of the most elite and effective combat units in world history. In all the human uh, annals of combat, the death head units of the uh, Totenkofferbande, the SSTV, the Schutzstaffel, or security service, TV units, or uh, death head units, these were the units 
that were able to take on entire Russian divisions. And uh, they were known as the Fuhrer's firemen. They were sent to any break in the line uh, to seal the break. And uh, they did so throughout the war. And uh, this is because their genocide was not based on empty hatred or racism or bigotry like the American bombardiers or British bombardiers that were uh, destroying entire cities to generate firestorms, to burn entire communities alive in the service of their Satan. Rather, the SSTV did what they did uh, for the health of Europe and considered themselves as such. The, uh, and because of the righteousness of their cause, their combat performance on the ground, uh, face to face, uh, kissing close to the enemy, was uh, some of the best combat performance recorded in human history. So uh, when you have the cowardly liars, the people who uh, are simply destroying the society, that's the Republicans, not the neo-Nazis, not the neo-Confederates. Those are people you can actually live side by side with, separate but equal, because so long as they have that, they are not the threat the Republicans are who pretend to be your friend. And uh, uh, it, as the Buddha, the great uh, Shakyamuni uh, Bodhisattva said, uh, the uh, evil friend, the false friend, is far worse than any uh, straight-bound enemy or honest enemy because they will not just poison uh, your body. They will poison your mind, your heart. They will destroy your life with toxicity. That is what the Republicans do through social media. And wherever social media's power increases, distortion follows, and the distortion has consequences. Uh, Politico has reported that Trump was the most successful in the emerging new deserts where social media sites are people's primary source of information. So we'll get back into this and what can be done about it in the second hour. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and Freedomslips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, Freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Okay, Revolution Radio on freedomslips.com is the largest listener-supported station on the internet. Keyword here is listener-supported. You, the listener, keep us on the air. Fundraising for April's moving ahead with $2,139 so far uh, for the month. You, our listeners, are always needed. Uh, Revolution Radio needs to raise $2,700 every month. And our thanks for your help in paying the bills. A big thank you all who have participated in Revolution Radio's ongoing fundraising. If you've not yet done so, do stop by our website at uh, www.revolution.radio. Click on the funding tab to view some of the many uh, fine options we have for you to express support with. Uh, and by example, we always maintain the Silver Eagle on perennial offer. Your PayPal donation notes, just play Silver Eagle and you will get a one ounce silver 999 pure Silver Eagle for your $60 donation in the United States of America only. Uh, this month's special is anyone who makes a $50 donation, uh, $10 then less than for the Silver Eagle, and requests one, will receive a Gadsden flag, the militia flag of uh, the yellow field and the rampant snake uh, coiling to strike, spit and don't tread on me. I mean, who doesn't want a yellow snake to wave around, right? Uh, Continental United States uh, requests only. Uh, also, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to the Freedom's Lips Radio Archives. Less than $5 a month, $4.95 monthly. Sign up at the bottom of the archives page. Uh, be certain to enter your chosen username and password. Uh, allow 24 hours for activation. All of our seed packs are back in available status as well. Check them out on the support tab uh, where they're included. Uh, varieties of non-genetically modified organisms, non-hybridized heirloom seeds linked uh, for each of the six. Uh, seed packs. I almost said six packs. Uh, single season family garden uh, seed pack for the same amount of donation as the Silver Eagle, $60. General emergency survival seed pack for a $100 donation. Uh, community garden seed pack for a $200 donation. I have my own website, of course, and my own uh, fiscal needs, which are dire uh, and need immediate support. Um, I know people out there are helping. I need more for this month at least. It's the worst month uh, I've 
I've ever had. I've told people about some of the technical problems that I've had. Uh, they've been compounded uh, by a, a few others. So I need all the help I can get. Uh, you can do so by ordering DVDs. You can uh, provide some help there or a straight out and out donation. Uh, if you're sending a uh, money order or check to myself directly, it would be to my address, uh, which everyone knows. They can look it up on Spokio. Douglas Dietrich, uh, 1242 Green Street. Uh, that's 1242 Green, like the color green, the street in San Francisco, California. And the zip code's 94109. Uh, 1242 Green Street, uh, San Francisco, California, zip 94109. And uh, just remember, if you hit my website, we don't have an ADS or an automated download system any more than a Revolution Radio. Your email must be seen and responded to by my executrix producer for Revolution Radio. Of course, it would be a member of the staff of Mike Ringley, the proprietor uh, thereof. And uh, you need to allow a full day, at least 24 hours for that uh, to happen in either case. Uh, I sell, of course, my DVD presentation, Satan's Crusaders, uh, two separate versions of Roswell and the Rising Sun, uh, available as DVDs at $30 each or in downloadable format for $15 each or both formats for the same presentation for $40, which I always recommend so you can see what's coming your way. See the new website at dddetrick.com. That's www.dddetrick.com. Uh, you will uh, PayPal, of course, uh, any orders, which you must uh, uh, signify our orders for merchandise uh, through L Solomon one at rgv.rr.com. That's spelled L S O L O M O N numeric one at symbol RGV for Rio Grande Valley dot RR for Roadrunner Service.com. Remember, that's how you would send donations to Laura Lee Solomon as well. Signify that they're donations for herself or myself uh, through PayPal. And, uh, and also, uh, if you're ordering products, specify the email address where you can send you your links. If you're ordering downloadable format, as well as your choice or choices of presentation. Uh, and if you're ordering DVDs, no additional shipping charges apply in the continental United States. But we will need a uh, physical mailing address like I just gave you mine or a P.O. box if you wish to maintain anonymity. Also, don't forget that you need to, of course, uh, provide us the titles uh, of uh, that you are ordering, uh, title or titles. And, of course, we are, are uh, supportive of uh, an outstanding member of TMT Trick, uh, Rose Dio, and uh, she's up there in Colorado, and she uh, manages the Mystic Warrior YouTube. Uh, and, of course, that's a channel you can subscribe to. Look up Mystic Warrior, uh, Mystic spelled with a K, uh, just like... Like uh, K is added to the end of magic to differentiate real magic from stage magic. And uh, M-Y-S-T-I-C-K, Warrior, look that up with Douglas Dietrich in tow. Uh, Mystic Warrior, Douglas Dietrich on YouTube, subscribe. And, of course, you can support her uh, morally or you can support her financially by going to her Facebook page and clicking the uh, dollar sign in the upper right-hand corner of the text box. And, uh, unfortunately, they don't accept Canadian dollars in the United States, but you can uh, anywhere uh, in the United States send her money, even out of Alaska or Hawaii, at www.facebook.com forward slash. Rose.do.54. Uh, you can also do the same with Laura Lee Solomon at www.facebook.com forward slash Laura Lee dot Solomon. Uh, our good friend uh, Rose has her own uh, email address. Uh, you can use that to send her money via PayPal. That would be arcomputech at yahoo.com. A R C O M P U T E C at symbol yahoo.com. Now, our uh, primary sponsor, Ben Astenius, has a birthday today. Shout out, of course, to my other primary sponsor, Sister in Struggle, uh, the lovely Fabia Floriani, uh, and, of course, to Ben Astenius, our dear brother in battle. And the Baron Ben Astenius uh, has a page, which I provided the link to, uh, to our uh, dear uh, executrix producer, Laura Lee Solomon, and that would be www.wagtimes.com forward slash driver benestanius all one single word dot html and uh it's basically at www.wagtimes.com forward slash driver benestanius you'll see benestanius in his glory days and uh just look up benestanius race racer benestanius racing or benestanius race car driver too you'll find these tag uh words will bring you uh directly to him uh surrounded by chicks and uh and uh and and um you know heavy duty machinery uh all the motorheads uh will envy 
Uh, so there you go. Um, he is, of course, now the guide for the Tucson Murders True Crime Tours, which provide historic crime investigations and have gotten lost crimes in Tucson, Arizona. These are small private tours hosted by a true crime researcher and enthusiast and will take you to real historic crimes locations related to these crimes in Tucson. Relive these events and hear the untold stories behind the stories. This season, see the Pied Piper of Tucson tour. Crimes that shocked the Southwest in the 1960s. These devastating crimes stained a city so deeply they may never be removed. For tour information, contact the Tucson Murders com or uh, phone Ben Estenius personally at 1-520 forward slash 323-3406. Do so to wish him a happy birthday. Today's his birthday. He turns 55 years of age, uh, half a decade over half a century of age. And uh, he's, uh, again, his personal number by which you can wish him happy birthday is 1520-323-3406. Uh, uh, his website, again, is the Tucson Murders com. Uh, and you can check out the unfinishedman.com uh, to see chapters from books he's working on or scenes from the films he's working on. Uh, and, of course, it's his 55th b- birthday to wish him well. Uh, we have, of course, our own transcription group blog, which we are working on retrieving the information through my executrix producer. Uh, hopefully we'll get it tomorrow or sometime soon. Uh, she'll call him if she can't find it. And uh, she's uh, looking for my GoDaddy account info so we can give it to the young lady who manages my transcription group blog, seeking with all my heart and all my soul at wordpress.com. And uh, they uh, that will ultimately merge the two websites. Uh, again, uh, seeking with all my heart and all my soul at wordpress.com. Check it out, be supportive, and of course, uh, report my gang stalkers via information that's uh, provided there. Uh, something you can do for me after all I've done for you. Uh, and if you're unaware of what I've done for you, then of course you don't know my background. So uh, in terms of uh, what uh, we can do for you now, uh, one of the things that we have to remember about uh, the um, uh, the news desert of social media, uh, which has become uh, many people's primary source of information, uh, particularly older people, uh, this is what led to half the success or a factor in the success of the Russian hacking of the election of Donald Trump. Now, uh, as severe as the consequences of fake news have been in the United States via the Trump uh, Putinista puppet presidency, they can be worse and have been worse elsewhere. I know that's hard for people to imagine, uh, but to give you an example, I was checking out the research of Marzuki Tarushman. Uh, he's someone from uh, the uh, Yugoslav region uh, where I served as a uh, military advisor. He is now the chairman of the United Nations Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar, uh, Burma, formerly. Uh, and he's described Facebook as playing a determining role in the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar, the Burmese Muslims. Uh, and he's concluded that it has substantively contributed to the level of acrimony and dissension and conflict that led to the, the genocide of Muslim peoples in Myanmar. I hope you understand the enormity of what I'm saying. I, I choke when I describe this. People read Facebook and they went out and killed people. That has also happened here. But not to the extent yet of racial genocide and ethno-religious ethnic cleansing. Ethno-religious cleansing. Even though these technologies are new, the horror, the despair of the current informational carnage is not unprecedented. Since the beginning of the internet, the unintended consequences of its arrival have been routinely compared to the fallout from the invention of the printing press. Uh, The comparison has been problematic, but it is, of course, warranted. It does apply. A great example would be the aftermath of Byzantium Fall. One of my great historical heroes and personal role model and very likely a distant relation is uh, the Anglo-bastardized title of Dracula. It's the original uh, Romanian uh, with, in the liturgical Slavonic would be Dithrak Agulvia. Dithrak is my surname, Dietrich or dragon. Uh, Dithrak Agulvia is simply the son of the dragon, uh, which was what that infamous figure uh, became known as. He uh, was, of course, a Romanian national hero to this day. Uh, he was a survivor of the fall of Byzantium uh, on the 29th in May, uh, that near eastern city-state of Zarlundgrad, or Caesar's city, uh, Constantinople, fell to Oz, or the Osmantine Empire of the Ottomans, the Empire of Medievalist Islam. Aftermath, a siege of nigh two months, 
and it prompted the flight of Byzantine scholars, or Greek scholars, as they were known in the West, en masse from the first capital of Christendom that had long served humanity as the second Roma, the second Rome. This scattering encouraged studies of the Hellenic peoples, the first classical Christians, culture outside of the Byzantine Orthodox Christian Empire began a revival of scientific learning based on classical Eleniki, aggression sources, which ignited the Renaissance, uh, a comparable socioeconomic and cultural parallel of Western revitalization via the Eastern debacle would be found in the scenario, say, for instance, of a far more catastrophic uh, 311 terror attack against the Japanese. 311 being their 911 when Fukushima Big uh, Daiichi or Big One, the cluster of nuclear power plant facilities, which were targeted by terrorism and their safety uh, control mechanisms shut down by a software attack. Uh, the same one that had shut down the uh, industrial control uh, mechanisms of the Iranian nuclear reactors that was designed by the Israelis was then deployed by the Israelis and the Americans against Japan so that Japan would agree to uh, put uh, sanctions, in place sanctions, against Iran. And uh, so this terror attack of 311, the uh, 7,000 islands of the greater Japanese empire, uh, was one that resulted in a marginal meltdown. Had it been truly successful uh, and uncontrollable, it would have prompted a consequent mass migration and resettlement of over 40 million refugee Japanese boat people on the west coast of the North American mainland, both Canada and the United States. And uh, it would have resulted, of course, uh, in turn in a cultural renaissance of the United States because nothing but good could come of 40 million uh, inherently uh, culturally superior peoples in a shithole like this. Uh, another example would have been the fall of uh, NATO to a Soviet invasion uh, and uh, the consequent migration of European people of talent to the United States had the Soviets successfully invaded Western Europe. Uh, there would be no European Union today. Uh, all of this is the equivalent of the fall of Byzantium. And what happened to the hero, the hero of Byzantium, Lord Dracula? He, of course, suffered the fate of being defamed by the first printing presses that were churning out only two things, Gutenberg Bibles and anti-Dracula propaganda pamphlets. Because, of course, what Dracula had to do to uh, finance any further resistance against the encroaching Islamic invasion of Europe he converted to Roman Catholicism. It's for this reason concerning his conversion from Byzantine Orthodoxy of the Romanian Orthodox Church uh, into Catholicism that he is known to the Balkan peoples as having become a vampire because his soul can know no rest, having betrayed the faith of Eastern Orthodoxy and Greek ritual for that of the Western Church. Of course, in the West, he was not welcomed by many people who feared him and decided to propagandize against him, and they even produced paintings, you can verify this, in which they showed him, Vladislav Sepish, Lord Dracula, present at the crucifixion of Christ, as if he were responsible for the crucifixion of his own God. And uh, it was this kind of relentless propaganda that allowed Americans to buy into the vampire myth and turn Dracula into a global level supervillain when had of course, he'd not been propagandized against, and the Pope been allowed to back him as the athlete of Christ, which the Pope had declared him, he would have been the liberator of Zagreb, or Caesar City, Byzantium, Constantinople, and there would be no Muslim incursions into Europe today. This is how damaging your information abuse can be. So in terms of the sheer bulk of opinion, the breadth of its dissemination, shock contemporaries, all of this can be found in English precedent at the time when they were propagandizing against tea uh, with, of course, the pamphleteering culture of the 16th and 17th centuries in England. It changed the nature of debate through technology uh, in a climate of nascent individualism with a politics rife with conspiracy the incipient continuous threat of a national breakdown and of course 
it was cheap, made on the smallest sheets of paper. Pamphlets were written for attention and money. Uh, then as now, successful strategies included exaggeration, uh, the generation and propagating of hatred of others. In the pamphlet's case, mostly against Catholics. Elaborate conspiracy theories were popular as well. It's hard to imagine, even from our point in history, the chaos and the sudden influx of huge quantities of opinion brought to Northern European society and culture via the British Isles. The turbulence was severe. And uh, the expertise at the time was irrelevant. Uh, George Wither, in his work, The Shoulders Purgatory, discovered in the Stationer's Commonwealth, published in 1624, said, What needs the stationer be at the charge of printing the labors of him that is master of his art and will require that respect which his pain deserveth, seeing he can hire for a matter of forty shillings some needy ignoramus to scribble upon the same subject and by a large promising title make it as vendable for an impression or two as though it had the quintessence of all art. Uh, the quality of an opinion in terms of its relationship to reality has never been of all that much importance at the point of sale. The commodity of ideas requires freshness and mass appeal. That's true wherever and whenever ideas are sold. So print was intrinsic to political polarization. And of course, the period leading up to the English Civil War saw a huge spike in the quantity of pamphlets published. The number of pamphlets produced in 1640 was 36% higher than the yearly average from the previous decade. That number jumped an additional 140% in 1641 and a further 98% in 1642. There was a reason they called them paper bullets. Pamphlets were both a cause and a tool of violence. How did the early modern period escape the violent distortion of the pamphlets? The honest truth is, it never did. The English fell into civil war on the basis of bias and falsehood. The only thing that put a stop to anarchy in England was the Great Fire of London in 1666 which slowed down the quantity of publication, at least. In both France and England, surveillance and censorship became stricter and more effective because of the, the Great Fire of London. After the pamphlet wars between the supporters of Louis XIII and Mary de Medici in uh, 1618 through 1619, several pamphleteers were sentenced to death. And the attempt to arrest unlicensed booksellers led many to flee the country. More broadly, the political chaos brought about by pamphleteering in France contributed to the absolutism of Louis XIV, who used the printing press as a tool of state control. Now, no one wants either censorship or the destruction of physical infrastructure. Obviously, there's another way, building institutions rather than tearing them down. The British responded with the Royal Society. It was founded in the middle of informational chaos to provide clarity and community. Uh, the principal reaction to the experience of civil war seems to have been less to try to enroll the new science to a specific viewpoint than to aspire to its establishment as a worthwhile step in itself. So uh, the organizers of the Royal Society sincerely believed that the enterprise to which the early Royal Society was dedicated was healing, that it would in some sense escape from politics by bringing together reasonable men from a wide range of ideological positions who could collaborate in gathering information which they hope that all would be able to accept. The motto of the Royal Society was, and still is, Nullius in verba. Take nobody's word for it. If I were ever in a position of secular power, I would ensure that motto was inscribed at the top of every smartphone. And other less formal institutions mattered as well. You had the rise of coffee houses because the caffeine addiction in England that finally overcame or began to balance their beer addiction. Uh, so what the Brits do, like all the white people do is they balance out the cycle of alcohol and caffeine, one to wake up and the other to relax. Uh, at any rate, it was the coffee houses, the ascent of the broadsheet newspapers, periodicals in the 17th century, using professional journalists with a sense of ethics that articulated a space between public consumption and a self-selected group of writers and readers. So the capacity for the dissemination of knowledge, its democratization, had to be mollified by the conscious attempt to create informational standards this required a great deal of struggle. There's an idea out there that the forces of technology are both inevitable and ultimately liberating. It's a philosophy popular among people who prefer their history vague so that their ideas can say, stay simple and grandiose. Uh, 
uh, making the comparison between the internet and the printing press indulges in a sense in this laziness. Hey, look, that was good in the end. Things worked themselves out for the best there. No, they did not work themselves out. People work themselves out. People of great intelligence and goodwill and outstanding national commitment, able to think beyond their narrow interests, work them out. And they only work them out partially and incompletely. So disruption and creative destruction have been the watchwords of the information revolution. Those who celebrate disruption believe they're serving progress. They're just celebrating their own power, like the people who are satirized on Silicon Valley. There are people who build and there are people who tear down. That's always been true. It's true now. I am a builder. The people who assault myself and my good name are the destroyers. And as a builder, I recommend constitutional reformation by an addendum of articles. I presented some before in preservation of privacy, in response to the need for recognition of indigenous peoples and minorities. I recommend a new article, Nonprofits and Public Ownership for the Public Interest. And I would insist the first phrase of that article, number one, national defense industries, healthcare, prisons, education, and news media must be nonprofit or publicly owned. No business, corporation, or individual can profit unfairly from federal, state, or local governments or public resources and must pay fair market value for all previous resources, subsidies, and research. So much of the worst in America and in all of human society and history has been driven by the profit motive. So much of the United States, state, local, federal, government practice is corporate welfare. Reverse Robin Hood as worse for billions for spa stadiums built for sports teams at the local level to trillions for the Defense Department internationally. Government in America funnels money upward from the working and middle classes to the wealthy elites and from the public lands to private elite hands. This is naked class warfare, both the cause of and maintenance of deep inequalities. Wealth redistribution upwards shows that those who maintain government should run, it should be run like a business, could not be more wrong. Businessmen have always had a history of being the worst presidents on the American record. Some matters are far better left to public management rather than private. This is why government is run by lawyers and not by businessmen. Done by the state with no private intent or to make a profit because doing so harms us all and is morally repugnant and unjust. But since partisans of capitalism are generally unmoved by moral arguments, I'll give you another consideration. Businesses are far less competent at public enterprises. They think in terms of individual profit for the next quarter rather than the long-term public good. Public parks are one obvious example. No one would reasonably want national parks opened up to strip mining or the crisis commercial theme parks. Both would lose the park's great value, aesthetic, public, environmental, and even long-term economically for short-term profit. Fire departments are an example we have learned from hard experience should never be private. Early American fire departments were, and they were notorious for incompetence and thievery. When your home caught fire, private fire departments demanded payment before they would put out the fire, negotiating with you while your place burned to the ground, with your family trapped inside. Off, they stole everything they could in burning homes, even looting neighbors' homes, and that took precedent over rescuing people that were trapped within. Competing fire departments even got into brawls over who would fight the fire so lucrative with the theft. Intelligence gathering is another area where privatizing has long been a disaster. Uh, but unlike the previous examples I've just articulated, America hasn't yet learned that lesson. The CIA looms so large in American consciousness, it'll surprise many. The United States had no national intelligence agency until 1947. And of course, you might bring up OSS or the Office of Secret Services in World War II, the reality was, of course, that that was organized by private adventurers. When you actually had an official government, uh, that uh, agency, the CIA, that wasn't until 1947. Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, relied on the Pinkerton Detective Agency for intelligence during the American Civil War between the states. They became notorious for violent union busting in the North, but they also routinely overestimated con Confederate troop strength by 300%. United States generals like McClellan, 
often refuse to engage their enemy, prolonging the war to Confederate advantage. In Iraq and Afghanistan, some of the torturers in prisons like Abu Ghraib were largely private contractors, unaccountable to the United States or international law. Some CIA agents volunteered for Iraq for six months, resigned, and then worked for private intelligence companies for several times their previous pay. Besides being overpriced, you've got a high turnover, a lack of experienced agents, and analysts almost certainly makes mistakes that cost American, Iraqi, and Afghan lives over the past several decades, prolonging, worsening both wars. The Iraq and Afghanistan wars still give us more examples of this folly of privatizing war, relying on mercenaries. I was one myself, but not in those conflicts. The most infamous of them all being Blackwater, later rebranded XE or Xenon. Blackwater mercenaries opened fire on Iraqi crowds, massacring dozens at a time. A drunken Blackwater guard killed no less than the bodyguard of the Iraqi president. Certainly, conventional troops commit atrocities, but they at least face military law, whose inadequacies are because of the protection of an old boys' network. Off times enlisted and junior officers will get punished with prison, while senior officers get their careers ended, but no prison time. Private mercenaries have far fewer laws to govern them. Off times none. I know. I was on the field as one. They're not bound by military codes or local laws. Rarely prosecuted, even for atrocities. Equally disturbing. More importantly for American society as a whole, mercenaries and contractors, actually support troops, have come to outnumber United States troops in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Without mercenaries, Presidents Bush and Obama would have had to withdraw far sooner or bring back an incredibly unpopular draft. The public turned against both wars after five years, so few Americans were enlisting that both the Army and the Marine Corps missed their recruiting goals for years at a time. Relying on mercenaries allowed both presidents, Republican or Democrat, to ignore public opinion and keep those wars going for half a decade more. So the article I propose would ban mercenaries and end future unpopular wars sooner. And of course, the U.S. defense industry, in Eisenhower's famous phrase of the military industrial complex, itself was one of the main drivers of the Cold War, then the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, now the current undeclared wars on terrorism in lands from Colombia to Central Africa to Yemen and the Philippines. It's socially and environmentally destructive to the United States itself, far out of proportion to its size. The need for war or the threat of war to maintain an American empire distorts our democracy and society. It gives us such movements as neoconservatism and government, such as homeland security, with this massive spying. Removing the profit motive will dramatically shrink all of that. Even if one is unmoved by moral arguments, you have to acknowledge another matter. For-profit defense industries are enormously inefficient and wasteful. Weapons routinely cost double or triple original estimates. Combat planes today cost more than if they were literally made of gold. Some military planes like Howard Hughes's Hercules or Spruce Goose never saw combat at all, were barely able to fly. Hercules was the most costly and worthless plane in history. By contrast, state-owned defense industries produced one of the most reliable and low-cost modern weapons in human history, the AK-47. Compared to the far worse U.S. commercially made M16, the M16 jammed so often, United States soldiers in Vietnam used them to hold up tents. They used them as tent pegs. Israel's defense industries, easily among the world's very best, have a large part entirely state-owned, much of the rest produced in partnership with the state. In the beginning, Israeli weapons were almost entirely produced by communist collective enterprises. Prisons are another area that remain ruled by and far for the public interest. Private for profit prisons give the owners incentives to lock up as many as possible. The need for profit cannot help but endanger not only the prisoner and the prison guard, but the general public in the long run. Abusive prisons where costs are cut to increase profit will worsen the rate of repeat offenders. Profit health care has given the United States the far lowest life expectancy in the developed world, especially for its cost. The worst of these U.S. health industries are drug companies charging up to hundreds of thousands of dollars for a single prescription. Typically, drugs cost a tenth in other nations compared to the U.S. The next costliest is Canada, about half the U.S. So two horrifying side effects are that many Americans are overmedicated because of the desire for profit and more Americans never seek treatment because they can't afford drug prices at all. And this is public school education comes to mind. 
It's funded unequally in America. School districts based on income for profit education, private schools. Of course, they reproduce from young ages uh, the inequality and elitism that undermines democracies. Contrary to public opinion, U.S. public schools have been getting steadily better for a third of a century, on the other hand. For example, the U.S. dropout rate is now less than one in 14, where in the 1970s, the time I went to school, it was over half. Most of the problems in public schools are problems of economic inequality brought in from outside the schools. And the generally acknowledged best types of schools in the U.S. are Catholic because they don't have profit as their prime motive, only education. So parochial schools would not be affected by my proposal, only elite institutions. This includes elite private universities, mostly attended by wealthy elites who receive far more public money per student than public colleges. This corporate welfare adds to elite institution graduates dominating most of the upper levels of government. Taking away public giveaways, making them nonprofits will end their old money bias and at least weaken their hold on our government, your governance. And the second aspect of this proposal, number two, no journalist, commentator, or others presenting themselves as experts in politics, history, law, society, health, medicine, or science can make more than five times the median national income. And any excess income must be donated to charity or it will be seized by the federal government. And I add this clause because much of the worst actions of the media are driven by profit. This includes not just deliberate falsehoods, but fear mongering, deception, propagandizing, hostility to empirical thinking and logical evidence. It wasn't always so. Believe it or not, as recently as the 1970s, News divisions at major networks were expected to be public services. The problem is not ideological for the most part, since some of the worst offenders don't even believe what they preach, like Alex Jones. To take the most obvious example, Rupert Murdoch, the Australian who headquarters Fox News out of London to influence the United States, whereas no one in England even watches it, doesn't agree with much of what his network and papers argue. He said so himself. It simply suits his business model to sell an ideology of fear and anger to a declining, a dying demographic. The simplest cure, again, is to remove the profit motive. Media should be nonprofit. A salary cap will help drive out those who harvest fear for the sake of filthy lucre. Media is enormously class biased in America. When watching a news channel, one is typically watching multimillionaires who work for multi-billionaires. Thus, the inevitable class hostility and hatred directed against the poorest. Think of how often there are calls to drug test those on welfare. Now try to think of any instance of a call to drug test CEOs and bankers on corporate welfare. You've never heard any except from Douglas Dietrich. Alex Jones has never suggested it, nor any of the other white trash pieces of shit. You white trash watch. Media figures have little idea of what it's like to be homeless or work for minimum wage. The best media today is that which is nonprofit, PBS, NPR, BBC. The worst news media is the most profitable of all, Fox. There's an equal need for an end to vast industries of outright hustlers, trading in not just fear mongering but pseudoscience, from climate change deniers to anti-vaccine vac conspiracists like George Nori of Coast to Coast AM, conspiracy theorists of every kind, and an entire industry of fake medicine, Today's equivalent of snake oil that sells by the tens of billions of dollars, faux medicine kills by the thousands, preying on the desperate who turn to it instead of tested treatments. Pseudoscience kills not just people, but democracies. An industry of deliberately false science has convinced two-fifths of Americans that climate change is not real. A separate industry of conspiracy theorists long ago ceased to operate with vanity presses and Xerox pamphlets today has entire networks peddling conspiracy thinking. Much of 1960s counterculture protest during the decade I entered this veil of tears. All that revolutionary energy was dissipated, chasing phantom Kennedy conspiracies. Much of the outrage against the Iraq and Afghanistan wars was wasted over claims of phantom missiles on September 11th, made by those who seem never to have passed high school science classes. All that I've articulated should still be perfectly free to state their opinion. They'll simply be unable to profit from them. There is a precedent in laws that prevent those who commit crimes from betting, benefiting from them, like selling books. In New York, it was nicknamed the Son of Sam law after the serial killer who was going to make a fortune off the people he killed. 
The same principle used against mass murderers can and should apply to those who make their living by serial lying, that they cannot profit by doing so. Let them show empirical evidence. And if not, no profit. The number of websites claiming that Douglas Dietrich never served in the Marine Corps would shrink down to zero if there was no ad revenue to be made from it, as you have at This Ain't Hell, but you can see it from here. The website of the Satanist pedophile, John Victor Lillier, who double dips and rips off his own fellow veterans by collecting 100% disability for his sexual identity and impotence issues, while, of course, collecting his full military pension, entirely illegal. By taking away his profit motive, he'll be unable to do what he does while defaming the name of my late and sainted father, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, whose headstone provided by the Veterans Administration says World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. There is no other headstone in the United States that has those three wars on it, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. I've looked it up and I can't find any. My father was the only man who served in all three of those wars and survived as a veteran. And the end result is other veterans with less military service to your constitutional republic want to destroy his legacy. And they want to destroy me because I'm the living outcome of his legacy. God damn them and all you who follow them. And all of you do it for profit, the same as the fake medicine peddlers who are killing people by selling snake oil. That's why you have to go and do what you have to do for me at the seeking with all my heart and all my soul dot wordpress dot com. And with that in mind, of course, we can bring up the third aspect of this proposition, this amendment to the Constitution. All journalists, commentators, and others presenting themselves as experts for mass news media will be fined every time they lie in their articles, broadcasts, or public statements. No person or media outlet can profit from lies or falsehoods and shall be fined at least equal to all profit, money, or benefits made from lies or falsehoods. Our nation's constitution should not be a defense for falsehoods. Media and media figures should be accountable for what they say and write. Those who argue for free speech of any kind and all kinds ignore malevolently the fact that the First Amendment does not sanction defamation, libel, or slander like John Victor Lilly or Richard K. Cole slash Stuart Allison slash Randy Kramer launch at Douglas Dietrich. It does not protect incitement to murder our Constitution uh, no, no more than it calls for callous recklessness that leads to mass panic. This is commonly known as the no right to shout fire in a crowded theater concept. The fact that the United States does not allow people to do that makes the United States more free, not less free from the need to worry about crushing each other in a mass panic due to some white trash piece of shit, shouting fire in a crowded theater. Neither should our constitution or our American society sanction or allow profit from the deliberate and knowing spread of falsehoods as comes against myself from my gang stalkers on the internet. For any opinion is different from a fact, despite any philosophical solipsist claim that everything is an opinion. The simplest way to toss solipsism into the shit can is to ask the believer to point a loaded gun at their toe and fire. Then let them tell us about their bloody foot and limp being just an opinion and that they don't need any help because it's all in their mind. Facts are black letter realities and the truths are oft simple Cartesian logic. More oft, either something is true or it is not. An opinion brings an interpretation, hopefully backed by solid evidence. For example, an opinion is, that is that capitalism or socialism is superior to the other, or a third system superior to both. It's not an opinion that capitalism is less than 500 years old. That is historical fact. I can tell you that as a student of human history. It's a blatant falsehood that free markets have always been around. The fallacy is a mere ideological propaganda claim known to non-dogmatic scholars in the social sciences as the naturalizing tendency of capitalism. This is why I'm such an ardent national socialist and a fascist, because that is the third way out of the communist, collectivist, dogmatic trap. The way to progress for all mankind without anarchy. 
falsehoods in journalism undermine the central purpose of journalism should not be allowed any more than one should be allowed to teach in a math class that two plus two equals five. What is just punishment for one posing as an expert spreading deliberate falsehoods or lazily passing them along without checking or because it suits their ideology? Fines should equal any and all profit made from lies, including salary, royalties, and advertising revenue, plus the market value of all free publicity gained by falsehoods. Again, I am not proposing interfering with anyone's entirely mythical, mind you, quote unquote, right to be a serial liar. Only they're profiteering from destructive lies like those of my gang stalkers. To give it an old fashioned analogy, one could still hand out books with falsehoods for free. You just can't sell the book to make a profit. And my fourth addendum would be the agency in charge of judging lies and falsehoods by journalists, commentators, or experts for the mass media must be entirely of respected historians for matters of history and politics, respected legal scholars for matters of law, and respected scientists or doctors for matters of science, medicine, and health, and shall be nonpartisan with no member affiliated with any party. A completely nonpartisan and expert agency is needed to judge and enforce these new laws. Otherwise, the agency would inevitably become censorship by one party or ideology upon all others. Thus, the need to be very specific written within the new constitution that I propose, a Dietrichonic constitution, not within ordinary or easily repealed law in which or who uh, one could make up such an agency and what they judge based on their own bias. It must be made up of experts in the particular fields, the most highly regarded in those fields, not partisan hacks or self-deluded amateurs. If defamation, libel, slander, can be punished without harming freedom of the press, why not this? If a judge or jury can assess such matters, why not an agency with members far more trained than the general public? In fact, we do have a model for such an agency in the current existence of fact-checking sites online. The great majority of these sites have laudable records as badly needed resources. What my article simply proposes is that such amendments, assessments, add financial penalties so non-profit from willful or ideologically driven lying. And that, of course, is just one aspect of a constitutional proposal. I'll bring up another in my next transmission, one that would be an article ending institutional support for hatred. I'll happily cover that next time, but it brings me back now to clarify some of what I brought up when I was feeling deathly sick with the sun sickness that I suffer from, my own solar voltaic sensitivity based on my peculiar genetics that I've inherited from my own matrilineal line of my late and sainted mother. I was speaking last time of, of course, the issue of homosexuality and uh, Alan Turing. And you might think this is a pet subject of mine. Uh, there are obvious reasons why it would be. But when I bring up the historical example of what happened in Britain, it's because I was leading into the damage I just articulated in terms of information warfare as conducted by Vladimir Putin when I was referencing a book that I recommended everyone read concerning Vladimir Putin's aspirations to destroy the West by destroying its very sense of reality. Now, forgive me while I rehydrate myself. Mm. But most recently, um, comparatively speaking, historically, a few years ago, when the GA, uh, GCHQ in England, the government communications headquarters director, Robert Hannigan, made a very rare public appearance at a conference hosted by Stonewall. Uh, the digital espionage chief informed the general public that it was a former spy who he referred to only as Ian. Whether it was Ian Fleming or not, I don't know. But he said this individual was forced out of the service on suspension of being gay in the 1960s, who had urged him decades ago to apologize for his treatment and that of men like Alan Turing. And to quote this GCHQ director, in the horrifying story of his treatment, a small ray of light is that he was not abandoned by all his colleagues at GCHQ. Many stood by him. More than half a century later, GCHQ now relies on those who dare think differently and be different. And to emphasize this, 
the director, uh, the individual who, um, it, you know, it's it's a Hannigan. Um, when he was trying to emphasize how much GCHQ has changed, he emphasized that they've had included hiring spies on the autistic spectrum with Asperger's or other syndromes, whom he described as precious assets in protecting national security. Now, I could give you an example of when I was in the former Yugoslavia, and I won't go into any details of the operation, obviously, so as not to incriminate myself uh, towards any United Nations or uh, NATO tribunal. Uh, but uh, the one thing I can emphasize is the fact that I was in a period where I was facing a host of unarmed people who were charging. And they were armed with everything available, broken bottles, baseball bats. Uh, I was killing them as fast as I could with an automatic weapon. And one of the people who was by my side was one of the civilians I was protecting, who everyone referenced as retarded. And I remembered he started mumbling in the Serpki language. 36, yeah, 36, definitely 36, 36, definitely, over and over while I was basically letting go with bursts of ammunition. I demanded what the hell he was going on about to his keeper when the old man cackled and said, can't you tell? He just calculated your ammo and figured how many left of the people trying to kill you and us will be left after you use it all up. Which convinced myself to take much more careful aim. And that's how we survived that mass charge of maddened peoples. So people with an autistic ability to instantly calculate who you never think will save your life can do so at a time that you may not yet imagine. That's what the GCHQ director Hannigan was basically saying indirectly at the Stonewall Workplace Conference in London when he said that the GCHQ supported the charities that brought about the Turing Law of Alan Turing in defending and promoting tolerance and acceptance without exception. And of course, I was bringing up pardoning the dead was fine. Something had to be done, of course, for the living. Uh, and of course, you have many other historical figures of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community in England that were destroyed by their anti-homosexuality laws, their discrimination. And, of course, it reminds me as well of the Labour uh, Minister of Parliament, Ben Bradshaw, who has proposed a pardon for the Exeter Three, the last woman hanged for witchcraft in England in 1682. And that would be something similar because uh, the 1604 statute against witchcraft led to their deaths decades later. And we had something similar happen in the United States. The state of Massachusetts thought it necessary because Arthur Miller, the man who wrote Death of a Salesman and married Marilyn Monroe, never made it clear in his play. So the state of Massachusetts took it upon itself quite admirably and commendably in 2001 to establish the fact that the five of the women hanged as witches in Salem were innocent of witchcraft and were not, in fact, practitioners thereof. So mere accusations based on these kinds of bigotry are what lead to people losing their reputations, losing their lives. This is why, while I was so sick, with sunsickness, I kept coming back in my latest transmission to Abdul Karim Haq, the friend I had to several relations with, who presents himself as a black Muslim and is probably the most bigoted black man that I've ever had long-term relations with in terms of uh, communicative friendship. There we have an individual who was angry because the Avatar series or the Airbender animated series I kept referencing while I was deathly sick and unable to maintain a train of thought he hated that series because the legend of Korra aspect to it 
the main heroine turned out to explore her sexuality and realize she was a lesbian. So we have an individual who not only hated homosexuals and also hated other religions such as voodoo because he felt that they were evil because of the bloodletting. When I myself am fairly hematophagic, it's one of the reasons because of my intake of blood so much, the animal blood that I drink, uh, oft times I uh, will drink rat's blood soup, Vietnamese uh, uh, men menu item that I brought up in the past. And uh, it's one of the reasons where I've indulged in so much of it, I needed dental care eventually because the richness of that blood actually took a toll on my teeth. Uh, now, ultimately, of course, he felt me uh, to be as damned as anyone working ritual voodoo because of their use of such because of that and uh, the ancestral worship maintained by my own relations towards offerings to the dead of food items such as uh, pieces of pork, pig, uh, fish, pork bellies, etc. And all of this was viewed to him in the most bigoted sense of something evil, some kind of magical, and, and this from an apasta in Islam. This is why everything he said was so offensive. Uh, yes, an African-American or a person of any minority can be just as bigoted and just as prejudiced, just as, as, as wretched as any white individual who's racist. It's just that these prejudices, these prejudgments and condemnations don't always go to people of other races. They can go to orientations, or religions. That's why I brought up my father being so familiar before I diverged, of course, into the, uh, his experience with the nuclear test that proved itself as J. Mo Reese, shout out to him again, so rightly provided us. That uh, nuclear test that I referenced turned out to be the world's first salted nuke. And that was, of course, a monstrous event, which my father survived. Uh, one of the reasons, again, why his detractors who falsify documents are to be treated with fear, loathing, disdain, contempt, and hatred. Because they would do that to the dead. You can imagine what they do to myself in terms of the living, in terms of the lies they generate, and the documents they falsify, which I can assure you are not extant to anyone who's worked with the government as a bureaucrat, as I have, in terms of documentary validity. Now, in terms of my dad's naval experience, he knew why San Francisco became gay, because the Navy would drop off all gay people in the Navy at San Francisco. They would abandon them. They would literally uh, summarily discharge them in a kangaroo court-martial that would never make it to the records, as I was kangaroo court-martialed in the incidents that I was a part of in the House of Saud that led to my parting quite uh, gladly on my part, from the United States Marine Corps. And in my case, it was the killing of two police who massacred a group of girls trying to escape a burning building at Abu Ghraib. And this is a verifiable incident that, of course, my detractors, such as Stephen Outram, the multimillionaire who wanted sex with me for a million dollars, declares never happened. The fact that someone can lie about such an incident and make that assertion is as bad as Holocaust denial. It is on that moral level. People like that, you spit on them and you kick them when you see them. And in terms of the reason why all of this is so important to me when I bring up how San Francisco became gay and why Alan Turing was prosecuted because of it, because all of this has ultimately served one man, the most homophobic, historical purveyor of toxic masculinity on human record, Vladimir Putin. So when I bring up the entire situation concerning fake news, homophobia, Vladimir Putin is the key linkage in all of these subjects as to how he's promoted a monstrosity like Trump upon yourself. And all of this was on the advisement through not just the philosophers that Vladimir Putin admired, but his current advisors like Alexander Dugin, a Russian Crowleyite and Satanist who became a convert to Aquino Sethism, the Sethic theism of theological Satanism. 
and ultimately an agent of the anti-gods. So in this war that I've waged all my life against my nemesis and presumably yours, Michael Aquino, the expatriate of the United States, who is now an, a resident of Scotland, along with Stuart Allison slash Richard K. Cole, what we have is a situation in which every time you're confronting someone who feeds you the alternative right propaganda line that Abdul Karim Haq ultimately fell for, the key and the weakness is their capacity for human hate. Abdul Karim Haq grew up reading Marvel comics, which were, of course, social justice warrior comics from the beginning. When you hear people say, like Abdul Karim Haq did on my own program, that social justice warrior mentality and publishing has ruined Marvel comics, they're feeding you a line of shit because that's all Marvel comics ever pushed. Marvel comics originated by, of course, men like, uh, oh God, uh, the author of Dunn's Conundrum. Actually, he didn't write the book Dunn's Conundrum, but I, uh, uh, Stan, Stan Lee. <laughs> uh, I always confuse him with the author who wrote Dunn's Conundrum, who has the same name. Uh, but Stan Lee was Jewish. And of course, many of the people like Jack Kirby and the giants of the industry were Jewish. And what they, of course, promoted was acceptance of the other through the X-Men who were unashamedly Jewish and even Israeli nationalist. Now, of course, there's negativity to be found in that because there was very little in terms of balance in presenting the Arab side of any story through Marvel Comics for a good many decades. But the other aspect of Marvel Comics was promoting black... Now, of course, there's negativity to be found in that because there was very little in terms of balance in presenting the Arab side of any story through Marvel Comics for a good many decades. But the other aspect of Marvel Comics was promoting black heroes, female heroes, and promoting social justice. All of the superheroes that everyone flocks to see in Avengers, Infinity, uh, Crossover, and Spider-Man, and all the rest of these superhero stories, all the way up to, of course, the uh, Black uh, Panther. All of these were produced by a politically correct social justice warrior mentality of Marvel Comics. So for someone to condemn Marvel Comics as failing now because of their so social justice warrior promotion of lesbian and gay superheroes is beyond disingenuous. It's downright insane. It is schizophrenic. So Marvel's doing what it always did. The difference is it's now running up against a wall of a deeper prejudice because people were more, more willing to accept people of other color than they were and are people of other orientations or transgender predisposition. So bear that in mind. These are part of the biases that we fight and struggle with on a daily basis that your enemy takes advantage of to turn your friends you once knew into enemies based on falsehood. Keep that in mind and keep your antenna open for who to trust and, of course, listen to myself in terms of making it law that none of this happened again. Turn this down, Saturday. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. 